Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome, everyone. Um, Nate, can you mute? Nate, can you I'm mute? getting an, an echo. All right. Okay, so I'm Alexis Badenmer. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association, and you have reached the U.S. part of the People's Food Summit. And our first speaker is Nate Kleinman. Nate Kleinman came to farming through political activism, most notably his participation in the Occupy movement and mutual aid efforts in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. He came to the conclusion that regenerative organic agriculture, permaculture, seed saving, plant breeding, and community gardening are the most powerful tools we have to address climate change and create social justice. In 2013, Nate Kleiman co-founded the Experimental Farm Network, an open, easy to use online platform for participatory plant breeding and other agricultural research. The Environmental Farm Network spreads knowledge and seeds to people working cooperatively over the long term to develop new crops and growing systems capable of mitigating or even reversing the effects of global climate change. In 2020, Nate launched the Cooperative Gardens Commission, a grassroots collective working toward food sovereignty in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and persistent injustice. Welcome, Nate. Thanks, Alexis. Really glad to be here. All right, well, um, I'll let you share your screen and I'll mute myself while you do that. All right, I'm going to uh, get started here. Um, okay, here we go. So uh, the topic that I'm speaking about today is um, how do we really feed the world? Uh, if you pay attention to the giant agribusiness corporations, they always tell you that they have the answer, that they are the only way that we're gonna feed the world in the future. Um, but uh, in reality, what they offer is uh, is the opposite. They offer a recipe for starvation and dislocation and um, increased climate change. Um, so as Alexis mentioned, my my story in this work begins in New, in, uh, New Jersey with Hurricane Sandy. Um, this was uh, Union Beach. Which, uh, which got really slammed right across the bay from Raritan Bay from New York City. Um, I'm going to talk just a brief, brief bit about um, the, some of the effects of climate change that are coming down the pike. Uh, this is the Muir Glacier in Alaska, 1941 to 2004, the photo taken in roughly the same spot. Um, I recently had the chance to fly over part of southern Greenland, and um, you can actually see these rivers of ice, uh, these glaciers um, flowing into the ocean, and it, it's increasing at such a such a rate right now. This is a, a new story from just about a week ago. Uh, a new uh, the NASA's NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab capturing fresh signs of rapidly melting glaciers in Greenland. Um, and you know when the when the polar ice caps melt, when the when the uh, when Antarctica eventually melts and the Greenland ice cap melts, this is what the map of the U.S. is is going to to look like, um, and uh, and you see most of the Caribbean there as well, and Mexico and Canada. It's uh, it's a true disaster, but we don't have to wait for that to happen for disasters. Uh, we're already seeing them all the time. Uh, this is a, a, a image of what it looked like in between 1961 and 1979. This map shows the number of days above 100 degrees. Most parts of the United States had less than 10 days above 100 degrees um, on average in a year. You can see different in the Southwest in Texas, they have some more. Uh, this is what the current projections show for uh, just 60 years from now. We're going to have in, in New Jersey where I am, we're going to have 45 or 50, 60 days over 100 degrees every year. Um, that's going to have a huge effect on, on agriculture, on, on our ability as a species to feed ourselves. Um, we really are not ready for this. It's, it's accelerating and, and um, we, uh, if we rely on these giant corporations, we will, we will never, uh, never make it. Um, this map shows the uh, dry places in the world where there's a drought and where they're having excessive uh, wet years. 
between 2000 and 2009. Um, this is the projection for 2030 to 2039. You can see drought conditions in some of the most productive parts of, uh, of the world, including the, the bulk of the United States. Um, and then this is what is projected for 2060 to, to 2069. Um, we're, we're getting awfully close to that and um, the effects are going to be really, really horrific. Already we have we have terrible droughts in, in many important food producing parts of the world. Uh, so, you know, people understand that emissions is, a, is responsible in large part for uh for climate change um but uh and, and of course uh the um extractive industries oil and gas and coal in particular um but agriculture plays a huge role especially industrial agriculture in climate change um this this is from the ipcc in 2014 the estimate is that agriculture forestry and land use uh other land use is is responsible for 24 percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions, which is about on par with electricity and heat production. It's more than heavy industry, more than transportation, more than buildings and, and other energy. So this is a this is a huge driver of climate change. And a big part of, of uh, what is driving carbon emissions in agriculture is simple, uh, the simple act of tillage. Every time you till the soil, you are releasing carbon from the atmosphere. You're destroy uh, into the atmosphere. You're destroying the soil microorganisms, the life in the soil that are responsible for soil's ability to to capture so much carbon. And it's the same whether you use a tractor or horses. If you're tilling the ground up, you are releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Um, our farming system in this country, which we are increasingly exporting around the world, is based on monoculture, growing one crop over a huge area. Um, and the the majority of the crops that we grow in this country are corn, which is all almost all genetically modified, soybeans, uh, same story, wheat, which um, thankfully it has uh, ha uh, genetically modified wheat has not been has not been approved, um, although there are some some that has escaped from experimental plantings. Uh, into wild populations of other grasses, um, sugar beets, which are genetically modified, and canola, which is as well. Um, and all of this, uh, all of these crops, these are the uh, underlying ingredients for the vast majority of foods that you see on the shelves in uh, in the average supermarket. And all of those colors, all of that, uh, all that different branding obscures the fact that. Uh, that there is not a whole lot of diversity in our uh, in our food system in in the the things that we are actually eating, um, and uh, you can see so much of that is based in uh, in the um, the corporate landscape of this country. All of these huge multinational corporations that have all of these tinier brands that they've bought up through the years. So it looks like you know you you might buy Cheerios and Lucky Charms and Golden Grams. Um, you're you're supporting one company when you do when you do that, um, and it's the same in the seed industry. Uh, I was using this this um, image for a long time when I would give talks um, from Phil Howard at Michigan State University. This shows the consolidation in the seed industry, um, but actually he recently updated it because of the uh, because of um, e even further consolidation in, uh, in in the corporate landscape here. Um, and this is a huge problem for, for biodiversity, uh, for the food system. We are relying on these massive corporations to provide seeds for, uh, for so much of what is grown and consumed by people around the world. Um, and when you have a system like this, that's all based on monoculture, you are destroying the land, you're destroying people's livelihoods as well. It, it's harder and harder for farmers to compete in this system, especially small farmers, and um, and it's terrible for the for the environment, for the climate, for biodiversity, for natural habitats. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about agrobiodiversity, which is the um, which is biodiversity of all of the species that we use in agriculture. Um, this is a this pretty simple chart shows the number of varieties of of a few different crops that were offered. By commercial seed houses in 1903, a sampling of just 10 crops, 
And then 80 years later, 1983, which of those crops from this survey were found in the National Seed Storage Laboratory? Which do farmers still have access to and, and plant breeders? And you can see, um, you know, 497 varieties of lettuce shrunk down to 36, uh, 408 peas down to 25. This is a huge tragedy, not just for, for culture, um, but this is this is problematic for, for the future of our food supply. Genetic diversity is at the root of our ability to make advancements, to make a more resilient food system, and make sure that we have enough food um, to survive the uh, uh, the latest virus uh, that that's going to attack potatoes, or um, the latest pest insect pest that's going to attack squash. Um, and as the climate changes, pests and diseases are spreading and increasing as well. Um, there's um, right now it's you're not allowed to import any tomato or pepper seeds into the United States because uh, because there's a virus that uh, that we're afraid of bringing here. Um, this uh, this is the Irish lumper potato, which is well known um, for being the main potato grown in Ireland just before the potato famine. Uh, while this is the this is just a sample of uh, of the biodiversity you might see and a market in Peru of, of potatoes. Um, but in Ireland, they were growing just that, that one potato. Most people know this story. If you have a diversity of potatoes and a blight hits, all of the ones that are susceptible to that will die. But with the di diversity, you'll have some that survive. If you only have one and they are susceptible to the blight, they're all gonna die. Um, but we can be creating new varieties of potato by planting the potato, true potato seeds that grow on these little berries that come after the potato flowers. Um, you get a little plant, looks like a little similar to a little tomato plant, and then you get new potato varieties. Um, and this is the kind of work that more and more people need to be doing. Um, I'm going to talk real quick about the concept of a land race, which is a population of cultivated plants that has a historical origin, distinct identity, and lacks formal crop improvement, as well as being often genetically diverse, locally adapted, and associated with tr traditional farming systems. Um, there's a slightly longer one here. But basically, a uh, land race is a population um, that, is, that is grown by a traditional farming community. And it because it, ha it, has, it lacks formal crop improvement, there's a lot of diversity in these populations. And almost all of the varieties of crops that are grown around the world have their roots in a traditional land race, like those, those potatoes. Um, or uh, this is a land race okra from Afghanistan. This is a land race squash from the Nanticoke people in southern Delaware and, and the eastern shore of Maryland. This is another one of those squash. Um, this is some land race wheat from, uh, from Turkey. And these are land race uh, corns from Mexico. This is just a small sample of the uh, existing biodiversity uh, in, in Mexico in corn. Um, there's also uh, an, a movement among seed people to uh, in, in the organic and small scale seed community to create um, what you might call synthetic land races, which are populations that are incredibly diverse. They are created that way they, from bringing together other traditional varieties and and uh, developing something that's uh, that's more diverse, in order to um, to create something more resilient for farmers and also for plant breeders, so that uh, people have uh, have um, more, much more diversity to to base the next generation of plants on. These are some uh, uh, dry bush beans from uh, Joseph Lofthaus in Utah, um, and these are these are uh, this is a synthetic pea land race from uh, Wild Mountain Seeds in Colorado, both of which. Uh, my nonprofit sells. Um, crop wild relatives are critical to maintaining crop biodiversity around the world. Uh, these are plants that live in the wild that are the uh, that are relatives of our of our crop plants. This is a, a wild sunflower that is a close relative of the domesticated sunflower. Um, but there is a we have a huge problem with um, biodiversity of uh, of um, crop wild relatives disappearing. This is uh, this map shows where there's global hotspots of distributions of uh, crop wild relatives that are in urgent need of further collecting because there are not enough of them in gene banks. Quite a quite a few in the United States. The Mediterranean is a hotspot. Um, Indonesia, uh, Brazil. 
and uh, China, um, among many other places. Um, it's really, really important that we get these crops into gene banks and that people start working with them. Uh, but it's also critical that we preserve the natural landscapes, the, the, the places where these things live, the habitats where these important crops, uh, reservoirs of genetic diversity live. Um, here's just a few of uh, few in, in the US. Um, and some of these crops for, for breeders who are looking for them are available through the USDA seed banks. Um, you, can, you can find this, the, the link is there at the bottom right of this slide, ars-grin.gov. And um, they will release this germplasm, any propagated material, seeds, tubers, bulbs, um, uh, cyan wood cuttings, to anyone who has a legitimate research, breeding, educational, or um, repatriation purpose. Um, so it's it's so important that we switch from a massive um, monoculture, chemical intensive system to agroecology, which I, I won't talk too much about, but basically it's a, a system, agroecology is a system that mimics natural systems. Um, it's the way most traditional farming uh, communities have practiced agriculture for millennia. And it's the way many traditional farming communities still practice agriculture today. It, it involves a mix of, of uh, species, um, trees in the canopy, bushes and sub smaller trees in the sub canopy, and then other plants, annual plants and perennials um, on the ground. And um, this is what we need to do all over the place. We need to switch to agroecology if we're actually going to survive um, in the future. The, the vast majority of farms and farmland in this country is growing these genetically modified foods that are a dead end. Um, but the biodiversity that can exist in an agroecological system is, uh, is, is where we have to go. Um, this is a really uh, important little chart from the uh, Latin American uh, summary. Uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, yeah, source Latin America and the Caribbean summary for decision makers. I'll, uh, I, I can put the actual source I got from this thing from. Uh, but basically, we need to transition from our conventional system into something that's improved, which um, things like your, your typical organic farm is certainly an improvement. But ultimately, we need to learn from indigenous and traditional systems and switch to uh, fully agroecological systems to, to actually have something that's sustainable for the future. Um, we need to preserve the biodiversity of threatened farming communities around the world. This is a, this is a melon from the Maldives, which are going to be one of the first countries under the, uh, under the waves as the climate changes. This is a, a thin, thin hulled uh, pumpkin seed from Moldova, which is a community under great threat from, um, from poverty and people leaving Moldova because there's no economic opportunity there in Eastern Europe. This is a watermelon from Syria, which is of course threatened by war, by drought. Um, another, a tomato from Syria. These are, uh, uh, this is a refugee farm in Lebanon where they're growing some Syrian varieties from seeds that we, uh, that my nonprofit got, uh, got over there. Uh, this is my friend Simon with some uh, some sorghum uh, from South Sudan, where he's from. Um, we uh, do a lot of work getting seeds back to the communities where they came from, because so many traditional communities have been um, have been divorced from their uh, from their traditional agricultural heritage. Um, but these many communities around the world, uh, this is a this is a local seed bank in India. Are, are doing amazing work preserving what is left of the, the biological agricultural heritage. Yeah, um, this, this is so awesome, Nate. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous photos. And you have collected seeds from all over the world. I hope that everybody gets in touch with you at the Experimental Farm Network. It's, it's a true experiment. You can participate in the EFN projects. You can get seeds from EFN. I put the link to your shop in the site in the on the site as well in Thanks. the chat. And um, everybody should get involved with Co-op Gardens, the Cooperative Gardens Commission. And Nate, I hope we have a chance to talk again very soon. Thank you so much for this me, fantastic me, presentation. Me too. Thanks so much. My pleasure. I'm going to zoom, zoom to the end and you can see the last, uh, the conclusion here. Um, but yeah, I hope that folks will, uh, will 
check out, check us out and learn some about um, the importance of breeding new crops to fight climate change and um, develop a more sustainable system. Thanks. Thanks, Alexis. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nate. See you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, Alexis, are we ready for the dairy presentation now? Yes, please. All right, here it comes. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is a panel discussion on the current status of organic dairy. We are um, going to quickly introduce the panelists and then set the stage for a conversation this morning. So we have with us today, Ed Maltby, the executive director of the Northeast Organic Dairy Producers Alliance. We have Jill Smith, the executive director of the Western Organic Dairy Producers Alliance, WADPA. We have Bradley Santi, Brad Santi, an organic dairy farmer from Maine, who recently lost his contract with Horizon Organic Milk, and Jennifer Beretta, the WADPA board president and California organic dairy farmer. Thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Kate Mendenhall and I'm the executive director of the Organic Farmers Association. We represent organic certified organic farmers nationwide. It's my pleasure to facilitate this panel today. So part of the reason that we are meeting on this topic today is that recently 89 organic dairy farmers lost their milk contracts with Danone North America owner of Horizon Organic Milk. This mass exodus from the Northeast affects farmers in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York. Ed, could you please give us a short overview of what has happened and why in the Northeast? Yes, thank you, Kate. Um, when, when Danone purchased um, Horizon Organic as part of their purchase of um, the larger White Wave consolidated company. Um, they knew from the start that there was a, a dedicated supply of organic milk in the Northeast because that was one of the conditions around the Justice Department deciding that there was potential for a, a monopoly on the supply side. Um, over the last two or three years, the, Danone has slowly um, allowed various farmers to leave, haven't replaced contracts. And uh, over a month ago now, they announced um, very indirectly with letters to farmers that their contracts would be canceled. They have a one year extension to August 2022. And the reason they gave was that the trucking cost of trucking milk to their dedicated plant in Buffalo, New York, on the far western side of New York was too expensive. Um, they did not announce beforehand or did not work with the farming community, organic dairy farming community in looking at various alternatives, it was just a, a um, letter to producers saying, you're canceled, your contract has ended. Um, this is particularly significant right now because uh, organic dairy farmers have no other buyers for their milk. Um, we're just uh, coming into uh, finishing an oversupply situation where the other buyers have their farmers on quotas. Um, so the demand for organic milk, especially in the higher cost area of New, New York and New England uh, is not in demand. It's cheaper to get the milk from the Midwest where there are larger dairies uh, and they have the economies of scale. So what we're facing now is a situation where the 
farms do not have any alternative buyers um, where there is very little opportunity to have their milk uh, processed by other uh, companies and a lack of infrastructure in the Northeast for processing and uh, packaging of um, especially organic dairy milk. Okay, thank you, Ed. Brad, could you share with us a little bit about how this has affected your farm and your neighbors? Um, mostly it's just we're not looking for extending debt or anything. Um, state's done a lot. They have a working group that's working on it. Uh, seems to be that there's something going to come into play in the next few months. Uh, there's hope. Um, not as much panic as there was a month, six weeks ago. So uh, that seems to be good. I think we'll have some answers here in the next few months. Um, I had a talk with a guy higher up in Horizon just Friday. He called to make sure that uh, everything was going good and if there was anything they could do to help with the situation. That's good to hear. How, how long have you been selling milk to Horizon? Uh, almost 13 years. They've been in the region for a long time, correct? Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Um, Jill, could you share with us a little bit how this mass exodus from the Northeast has affected producers in the Western US states? And has this happened in your region before? Sure, thank you, Kate. Um, we have lost a lot of dairies out in the Western US over the past several years. Um, often entire regions at a time, much like this situation. And um, we too have very few options for where we can ship our milk. Um, you know, there are some producers that find homes for their milk, but it may be with a handler that there's no contract with that. You know, it's just a home for their milk. So it's, it's not a very stable situation. And then we see others that, you know, are just in a position where they feel like they're better to shut their dairies down, which is heartbreaking because a lot of these are the pioneers of the organic dairy industry, much, much like the Northeast region. You know, they really built the organic milk industry and created that trust and integrity behind the seal. So, um, you know, and then we also have pr producers out here that um, are faced with drought, are faced with extreme feed prices, and we don't see uh, the price for organic milk keeping up with that. It's remained at a relatively unstable price point. So, you know, you don't know what your future looks like as a business. And um, again, it's that lack of infrastructure, that consolidation. There are just fewer and fewer homes for organic milk. Thank you, Joe. Um, Jennifer, could you please um, add to that from your farm perspective? How has um, this trend affected your farm and your neighbors? So this trend actually started about five years ago. Um, our farm was one of eight in the Sonoma County, Marin County region that was dropped by the Danone Horizon uh, company. Um, we used to ship to Wallaby Yogurt and Wallaby uh, sold to White Wave. And then when White Wave sold to Danone and, um, and you know, and I knew right away the Horizon Milk thing was going to be bad. I'll be very honest about that. And when then uh, White Wave sold to Danone is when we got our notice that in nine months, our contract would not be renewed. Uh, so four years ago, we were very fortunate to ship a load of milk to our new creamery, Clover Sonoma. But we were one of two that got picked up. And there was six others that you felt heartbroken for where they were going to ship their milk. Um, they got picked up by a, um, what we call a handler, and they still are shipping milk today, thank goodness. But uh, we, the West was kind of the first of the Horizon Denone disaster, I call it. Um, they moved from Sonoma County up to the Ferndale area, went to Oregon and Washington, and now they've gone to the Northeast. So for us, um, it's been really hard to watch this happen because I know what it feels like um, when it comes to what happens now is you know, they're going to bigger farms, uh, cheaper milk. What does that do for the, the smaller farm? That, that was what organic was meant for. 
our dairy wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for organic. We're very pasture based. We were able to move out of conventional 14 years ago, go organic. Um, and now I feel like that organic uh, mold is different. It's bigger dairies, cheap milk, and that's not what it was supposed to be like. So for us, um, we just hope every day that our company continues to pick up our milk and we hope that the guys in the Northeast find a home and we hope that this doesn't draw down the market price even more by Danone Horizon, you know, finding bigger dairies and cheaper milk. Thank you, Jennifer. I'd like to just spend a little bit more time on um, the point that Jennifer brought up. And Brad, I was hoping you could explain a little bit from the Northeast and then I'll come back to you, Jennifer. What are some of the differences from these family farms that are being dropped um, from Horizon from some of the larger farms? Because I don't think that Horizon is reducing the amount of milk that they're selling, but they're buying from different buyers. So what are the different contributions to the environment and the communities that these family farms are making? Um, around here, like it's all 50 to less than 100 cow dairies, Thai stall or free stall. There's not a lot of big farms around us that are organic. So once you go bigger, it's a larger footprint and everything. Um, I don't know. And how, and how does that, um, I mean, if you weren't farming organically, would you be in the conventional system? What are the sort of other impacts to clean water and um, habitat? creation that you're you're contributing to with your small organic dairy uh, well with pasture base instead of having cows combined uh, more roaming natural habitat for the cows compared to just large free stalls where milk companies just want to back up and grab a tanker of milk now they don't want to stop for four or five thousand pounds all right, thank you. And Jennifer, could you um, outline a little bit about um, what the Western organic dairy farms look like compared to some of the larger um, organic CAFO farms that some of the larger companies are starting to rely more on? What are some of the environmental services that farms like yours are providing? Um, so I'll just give the example of the eight in our area that were dropped. Um, so that was eight family farms, probably totaled about 2,500 cows, which the dairy they kept on in California totaled 2,500 cows. So you just dropped eight families um, with employees that gave back to the community, that gave back to the economy. Um, you look at what we did on a standpoint of pasture base. Um, you know, for us, we're applying for NRCS dollars and, you know, carbon footprint and all that. So these bigger dairies, their footprint may be a little bit bigger. Um, they're still probably following all of the water quality rules and whatnot, at least here in California. But when you look at it in a sense of how many families no longer potentially will be shipping milk, what that does to the economy, what that does to the employees, that's more people out of work. Um, and then you think of, well, that's just cheap milk. That's not the organic model. Um, like I said, you know, we went organic because we were pasture based. To me, a 2,500 cow dairy does not meet the organic rules that are set in place for us when it comes to pasture, how far they have to walk how many days out on uh, pasture and their dry matter. So it's things that for us as a dairy farmer, we look at, well, how does that 2,500 cow dairy meet the rules when I know what it's like for me at 300 cows and 400 acres just to meet the pasture rule is. Thank you, Jennifer. I wanna move on to our next question um, and start with you, Ed. What are some possible solutions for the organic community to consider? You mentioned some of the infrastructure problems and um, some of the policy issues. Could you highlight some uh, solutions? Yes, and uh, looking from a Northeast point of view, and it's uh, from what the others have said, it's similar uh, across the country. Um, one of the biggest issues is infrastructure and most organic dairy packaged milk is now ultra pasteurized. And so there are a lot of smaller dairies, smaller processes that have closed down because they cannot meet those standards and have not got the capital investment to bring their dairies up into uh, compliance with the ultra pasteurization, which ex effectively extends the shelf life, which the large supermarkets need for their warehousing. Uh, in the Northeast, uh, we have uh, formed a, a regional task force, um, which is looking at various um, opportunities uh, for direct marketing 
uh, for um, taking full advantage of the local community, uh, but we're coming coming up against the uh, requirement for processing, and that's why again we've extended uh, to look at different initiatives from different investors uh, and looking to a longer term future uh, when we can have dedicated processing facilities that can handle the smaller amounts of uh, organic milk that uh, can be sold locally, that can be used in value added products, that can be fed directly into the local community uh, and so the consumer then can have a dedicated supply that they know comes from local farmers uh, who support the community and we have a very active consumer base in the northeast so it seems an ideal situation to try and combine those two things uh, and it'll obviously take some time which is why the um, OFA launched that uh, petition to our Stana to extend the contracts and also to consider uh, giving some sort of severance package to those farms that they are effectively laying off, uh, some, some of whom have been with the Horizon brand for 20 years. Uh, so they're the two of the initiatives that we are looking at in the Northeast. Thank you. And Jill, what are you seeing as some possible solutions for the organic community to consider in the Western states? Well, when I think um, as a whole, the broader organic dairy community, uh, we're working to come together and stand by each other. So I think that's really important. Um, and I think that helps if we stand together when we're looking at the contracts that are offered to producers and as we negotiate those contracts. Um, and again, I think there's some infrastructure we can put in place, much as Ed said, maybe there are transfer stations where a region ships to a transfer station and a processor or a handler can take it from there. I think we can help our consumers understand where their milk comes from and supporting these regional models that are out there um, and and let them know that they are voting with their dollars out there, right? If they want to see change brought about or they want to support local family farmers, you know, use your dollars to vote for what we're doing and, and the practices that you feel good about. Great, thank you, Jill. And um, Brad, do you have anything to add? Uh, I guess what they're saying is, got to get back to the consumer that this is what they want is pasture based and by losing these 89 farms that's what they're potentially losing so we're trying to do a marketing campaign for that and get directly to the consumer instead mm -hmm. thank you great point consumers have always been so important in partnering with farmers to grow the organic movement and keep it the principles of organic at the center. That's a really great point. Um, Jennifer, do you have anything to add? I definitely think, um, you know, just making sure that consumers understand where their milk comes from. And um, that's a big one we see here. Um, it's not about, you know, you have the activists that don't like dairy. Um, honestly, most people just want to know where their milk comes from and that it's done right and followed, followed the rules. So definitely making sure that we push home that the creameries and the dairies that are doing it right and to buy their products and to support those dairies and those um, those areas. Um, I think that's the biggest one, really. And then two, you know, making sure that things are getting through Congress. Um, the people we vote for are the ones that are hopefully going to be on our side when it comes to some of these bigger rules. So they also have a play in that, too, of who they're voting for and who they're supporting and how they're going to support our industry um, in D.C. and at a state level. Thank you. And Organic Farmers Association in connection with NADPA and WADPA and regional groups in the Northeast have a petition that we encourage folks to sign on to that not only puts pressure on Danone to come back to the Northeast and find a solution, but also keeps you in the loop for future action to tell Danone that we want to be buying organic milk from family farms that are based in pasture and grass and um, the best organic principles. So um, I'd like to move now to 
what are some policy protections that would help prevent this and what can consumers do um, in addition? So Ed Maltby, I'll start with you. Uh, yes, there's two issues um, being working their way through the regulatory side of uh, the USDA, uh, the National Organic Program, which certifies organic uh, in the US and um, uh, internationally, uh, is putting together regulation that will um, clarify uh, the how conventional dairy cows can be transitioned uh, to organic production. Um, and to ensure that that uh, clarification is implemented by every certifier across the country. At this point, different certifiers have different ways of implementing the existing regulation. Um, we're looking to USDA to publish a final rule after nearly 10 years of working with them to get the uh, clarification that is required in order to make the uh, give the certifiers the power legally to issue non-compliances when they see that the transition isn't happening correctly. And this one-time transition exemption is was originally put in the uh, Organic Food Production Act in 1990 to ensure that conventional dairies would be able to transition their existing herds into organic without losing the long-term genetics, the long-term uh, herd immunities. Um, but after that one-time transition, then everything else had to, uh, to be bred either on the farm or uh, ensure that it was organic from the last third of gestation. So that essentially means that uh, it had to come from an organic cow that was under organic production and the calf then would be reared organically. Uh, what has happened in the last 10 years is that some certifiers have allowed a uh, continuous transition of uh, conventional animals into large organic herds. And this culminated in 2016 um, when demand for organic milk increased and some of those larger herds then transitioned a large number of uh, conventional animals into their organic herd and we ended up with a surplus over the whole country. That surplus um, uh, caused a 25 to 30 percent drop in the price that farmers get uh, for their milk and a lot of uh, farmers had to leave the industry uh, because they couldn't survive at that price and because the buyers uh, no longer wanted their product. And the major buyers, the two major buyers, Organic Valley and Horizon Organic, uh, then uh, put quotas on the farmers as to how much they could produce. We're now slowly uh, reaching a point where that surplus is disappearing. Um, but we need to ensure that USDA publishes a final rule quickly. It's working its way through the USDA process, but we need uh, consumers to keep, to keep talking with their representatives and their senators to ensure that pressure is continuously exerted at the USDA level. So again, it doesn't get lost in the busy work that uh, every agency has these days Without this uh, final rule, uh, which legally lays down the language of how conventional animals are transitioned to organic, then if we don't get that in place and we reach another situation where there is a, um, a, a, an increase in demand for organic milk, uh, then we'll be in a situation that, again, we'll have a surplus, a drop in pay price a drop in a number of farmers that can survive. So uh, consumers should continue to talk to their uh, representatives and their states, uh, their, their senators to ensure that there is pressure on USDA to complete this final rule. Thank you, Ed, that's so important. So consumers can call their 
local representative and their two senators and ask them to tell the USDA to finalize the origin of livestock rule as soon as possible. Um, that's a really important message. Jill, um, what do you have to add? What are some other policy protections that would help prevent this and maybe other things that consumers can do to support family organic dairy farms? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think, you know, I'll second Ed in that we do need um, policy improvements or straight strengthening of some of these organic standards. And, I, and I'd like to point out that the majority of us organic producers are doing it the right way. You know, we really are. And um, we're taking a, a holistic approach when we look at our farms and the system that we're creating. And so um, I'll second Ed too, we need consistency with our certifiers, no matter your size, scope, scale. We need, we need pasture enforcement. People need to be following those guidelines. Um, and I think another important piece is that we need to recognize that organic producers um, are part of climate change mitigation. And people can look to us as models as we continue down this path and as we discuss it more and more, you know, we're models and we, we can be out there showing people what works and what doesn't. And there's a lot of value to that. Um, I think in this specific situation too, you know, con consumers can let their expectations of what a B Corp really should be they can they can be heard on that front um and i think just a couple of other things is that we can look to our retailers too as we see the growth growth in private label um dairy products we can look to our retailers and and ask them to really research where this milk is coming from and and what they're supporting and what they're relaying to their consumers because consumers do rely on them to do the research and then i would also challenge consumers to really look out there and support regional or local products that are in the marketplace. They oftentimes don't get the same shelf space in grocery stores or have to sell through other routes. And so, you know, just look around and see what's out there. And usually these regional farms, mine, for instance, you know, we're very transparent. We let you come out and see the cows, see the grass, that sort of thing. So, you really do know who you're supporting and that you share the same values as your dairy producer. So um, yeah, but I second that we really do need stronger enforcement as well of our rules. That's great, Jesse. It's nice to have some concrete things you can do when you go to the store, um, looking for other local, more local organic milk labels and you know, taking that first stance with your dollar and putting policy pressure on and also telling your grocery stores, please buy from these local farms. Um, they're doing things right. So those are great points. Um, Brad, do you have anything to add? No, I agree with the, uh, we just need the policy to be in effect. You can't have from one state to the West Coast or whatever. It just needs to be straight across like organic was meant for. Yeah, I imagine it's very frustrating when you're held to a very high standard on your farm and you see other farms somehow getting that um, precious organic certified label without holding to the same pasture standards. Yeah. And, and like Jill said, so many farms are doing it so well and right and holding up the organic principles and often going far beyond what organic is requiring. Uh, Jennifer, what else do you have to add? Um, I would just add to um, the way that our certification is paid for. Um, I feel like it's a fox holding in the hen house. Um, you pay on how much you make. So when there's a very large dairy paying a very large fee to our certifiers, sometimes I wonder, are they just not um, dinging them because of how much money they're brought in? So if there's a way that we can tweak how we're paying our certifier i feel like myself my dad you know some of the dairies around us would feel a little bit more confident in in the certification process uh definitely being um you know across the board how our certifiers certify i work with three different certifiers in our area i help some dairies with their paperwork and it's very different every certifier and so how can we be almost the same but a different company um, and making sure that the rules are being followed the same 
I would also just challenge the consumer, um, you know, to really know where their milk is coming from. It's not about sometimes that animal humane label or the non-GMO label that the farmer, you know, yes, we are doing that right. But look into what these companies are doing back for their farmers, just like um, we're seeing today. What has Horizon done for their farmers? Not drop them, but they need to be doing better for them. Um, so, you know, look for those labels like animal humane, non-GMO, but also do the research on what, how these companies treat their farmers. Cause at the end of the day, um, how we're treated is how we are going to get our milk to the shelf as well. Um, and if it definitely buy local, um, and support local, if there's a new creamery that's being started up or a value added, make sure you go support those farmers, um, and see what they're doing. There's a reason they're doing it. Um, and they're going to be doing it right. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. All right, our final question, um, what should organic farmers think about for the future? Um, we'll start again the same order, Ed. Um, the critical factor is to work together. As everybody's, everybody's been saying, we have the same problems across the country. And although the size of the farm may be different and the type of farming may be different, uh, we all need to work together to uh, leverage what we have, which is the human capital, um, the uh, dedication to farming with nature instead of against it, and the, the strength of the family unit in farming to improve the environment, to ensure that we have a very high quality product that is produced without the use of herbicides, pesticides, um, and can talk directly to the consumer with a strong confidence that what we're telling them is the truth. Uh, it's not just some marketing uh, campaign that is uh, used by some large multinational conglomerate. Um, it is the truth. We are producing organic milk following all the regulations across the country and we're producing it to benefit ourselves and the community. Thank you, Ed. Um, Jill, what should organic farmers think about for the future? Well, again, I'll second Ed and say that it's essential that we work together. We have to stand together because, you know, this region is going through it right now, but there will be another one just down the road, you know, here that we'll see go through it. It's going to continue to happen. Um, but I think we need to stand uh, united and continue the work that we are doing because I think we're all doing it because we think it's the right thing to do for the land, the animals, the environment, and be transparent about what we're doing. Because going back to the farmer, I think sometimes, you know, the farmer does get get villainized uh, these days. And, you know, you either have a love for cows and dairy or you wouldn't keep doing it. You know, I mean, it's it's a choice because your entire family is impacted. Um, and I think taking it further with working together, we can find efficiencies if we work together. We can negotiate contracts if we work together. We can stand tall for higher standards if we stick together. And, um, you know, even find efficiencies if we share our resources and are working toward a common goal. But I think every dairy producer has to be prepared for this being a possibility for themselves. It's, it's easy to say, oh, these are small dairies, you know, and they're, they're, um, they don't have as many cows maybe, but at the same time, you know, that list gets shorter and shorter and, it, you know, it's, it's likely to impact all of us or in Jen's case, they've been through it on multiple levels. So, um, it, it's something you have to be concerned about as a dairy producer and really try to um, look at your operation and make it as sustainable and stable as possible to weather these storms. Thank you. Ed, what would you have to offer to add to that? What should organic farmers think about for the future? Um, or get directly to the consumer. I've had more consumers that don't know the difference between organic milk and conventional. And uh, we're an okay farming community around here and people still don't understand the difference. Um, we could all stand together no matter, or conventional, but 
there's not a lot of us left anymore and uh, just it's going to be passed down to the next generation and there's less and less of them that even want to do it so, trying mm -hmm. to do is get people to understand what we do every day thank you brian and jennifer what would you like to add i think to joel's point to know that um, just to be very prepared that it could happen to you any moment, no matter what size you are, no matter what creamer you are. Um, I never thought that Wallaby would ever uh, have sold. Um, it was a family thing that he sold and then to have sold and be dropped from a company that, uh, I mean, Jerry, the owner used to sit in our kitchen and bring us yogurt. And so, you know, we never thought that that day would happen. And I don't think anybody thinks that day is going to happen, but be very prepared. Always have your your um, guides up and, and you know, see what's around you. Um, we're very fortunate in our area. We have a couple of creameries that if maybe Clover decided to drop us today, we could go ask, but the guarantee of us getting picked up is still not there. Um, also to think of maybe that value added on your farm and maybe it's not about milk, but maybe you're you know shipping milk somewhere, but you have a you pick or getting the consumer out there to see show you what you're doing and then um, have something else uh, for them to also do. Uh, maybe it's flowers, strawberries, I don't know. But just getting that consumer on farm to see what you're doing, to see the organic model, and then to everybody else's point, to make sure we're all standing together in this. Um, that's really important for us all to be on the same page and fight for each other, no matter what creamery um, you ship to. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I just want to remind our audience that the U.S. Department of Agriculture did not start the organic label. They did not start the organic market. Organic was started by organic farmers and consumers together. And so it really is our label, it's our food, and we need to continue to work together to protect it, to keep our farmers viable, to grow organic farmers across this country so that we can continue to get local healthy food and prove our own um, community's food security, our own environmental um, protections, clean water, clean air, and to sustain these family farms that are working so hard to grow healthy food for all of us. So we, it's really important farmers and consumers continue to work together. This is one problem here and we need to work on this now, but we also need to be conscientious about the quality of the organic market and put pressure on the government to keep it um, emulating the values that started it in the first place. So. With that, I'll just move to any closing statements that anyone would like to make before we sign off. Ed? Uh, no, just to thank the consumers of the world for continuing to purchase organically certified uh, products and to work with farmers to ensure that we, as Kate has said and others have said, that we can keep the standards high and that the farmers reap some of the benefits financially of being able to sell their products organically. Thank you, Jill. Uh, well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming together just to talk about this and address this because that hasn't always happened in the past. You know, farmers haven't been able to speak about the situations they've been faced with. So I'm I'm encouraged by everyone who's come together and really taken a look at this situation and um, tried to help these producers, even if it's just, just messaging their support. But again, we're thankful for the organic consumer. We're thankful for the farmers who are out there striving to be good stewards of the land and the animals. Um, and just, you know, we're, we're trying. We're trying on so many levels to do a great thing here. And so um, if people would recognize that, and I, I guess maybe say thank you to your farmer. I, I'm not sure, but, um, but we thank, do thank everyone for coming together and talking about these issues. Thank you. Um, Brad, I'll go to you. Any closing remarks? Uh, I don't think so. Thank you so much for being here today. I know this is a really trying time for you and the other Horizon farmers in the Northeast. And I just so appreciate you for having the courage to join us today and speak up. And um, we wish you the best and hope that you find a new market for your milk and continue to, to flourish your organic dairy and to pass it on to your children in the future. Um, Jennifer, any closing mark remarks? Um, I just wanna say thank you to the organic consumer. And I think that it's been a great 
interesting to see, you know, the four of us, five of us sitting here collaborating on things and how to make things better. Um, it gives me great hope that we can all work together as we move forward. And I just encourage every consumer to, um, you know, really know where their milk comes from. And yeah. Thank you so much. Um, to Ed, Jill, Brad, and Jennifer for giving your time today to share with you your experience and to help us better understand what's currently happening um, in the Northeast, but also for dairy farmers nationwide. I know that this audience really is committed to healthy organic food, so please continue to support these dairy farmers and work with us as a community to fix this immediate problem and then shape a new future that's more sustainable for family organic dairy farms that are doing such a great job on their farms. Well, thank you so much to Kate Mendelson and everyone who participated in that panel on the organic dairy crisis. I urge everyone to check out Organic Farmers Association and the Western Organic Dairy Producers Alliance and the Northeastern Organic Dairy Producers Alliance to find out how you can help that situation. But the best thing we can always do is buy organic milk, buy organic milk from farmer co-ops and direct from the consumer, or direct from the 